I'm sure some folks will still participate in politics, hoping they can find a benevolent ruler to at least mitigate uh, some of the infringements in place now. Look, but guys, that's, that's, that's a road to nowhere. It's a road to beatdowns on the street, extortion, and democide with an even greater loss of freedom year after year, election after election. And it's, it's one of the most vicious falsehoods perpetuated throughout the ages. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, naive notion that politics can set you free. Uh, and that's why I've been so harsh on the anti-libertarian libertarian party, uh, because, uh, as I've said before, the people are sick of politics, the left-right paradigm. So what do they do? They give them more politics. It's, uh, it's the most uh, uh, insincere and ingenuine thing you can do to a fellow human being. It really is dangerous to be an anarchist, and it, it will only get, I mean, it, you know, as per kind of the, the stages of Agoras and that Konkin kind of laid out, it, it's, it's going to get worse, and then it's going to get better, but, you know, when, when's it, when's it going to start getting better? You're listening to Liberty Under Attack Radio, and now your host, Shane. All right, and welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism and action. I'm your host, Shane. This episode and everything found on the website is covered by Bipcot No Government License. This allows reuse and modification to anyone, except for governments and the bludgies thereof. You can learn more at Bipcot.org. So last week, you heard part one of two of my discussion with Daryl Becker from Voluntary Visions. In that episode, we discussed the philosophic corruption of reality and the role that it played on physics beginning as early as the 20th century. This week, we'll discuss uh, the Electric Universe, a great example of a return to classical physics that is based off of experimentation and observation rather than mathematicians parading as physicists. Next week, you'll hear my interview with Wal Thornhill, uh, which I recorded this past Monday. Uh, Wal's a physicist from Australia and one of the main experts in the study of the Electric Universe. Uh, when there's uh, new discoveries or anything, he's always uh, kind of their go-to guy. Uh, so uh, that'll certainly be an interesting discussion that you can look forward to uh, in the future. Uh, so yeah, what, what you're about to hear will serve as a, a very good introduction uh, for my discussion uh, with Mr. Thornhill. Uh, so that's all I have for you. Please enjoy, and uh, definitely let us know what you think. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. So I guess but, so we're, we're, we're going to change gears here So uh, to, to the Electric Universe. So the listeners, you, know, you guys may be asking, uh, so Shane, Daryl, how is this relevant to the discussion you know, we just heard? Well, Easy. Uh, Walt Thornhill, a major physicist on this subject, uh, has acknowledged the importance of, of Harriman's work. I think it was in the uh, in his lecture, "The Elegant Simplicity of uh, of the Electric Universe" or something like that. Uh, and you know, the e, the Electric Universe uh, EU. Not we're, we're gonna. I'm probably gonna use EU more often than Electric Universe. I'm not talking about the European Union here. Uh, it's a return to classic experimental objective physics. Uh, and also, you know, aligns with Occam's Razor. You know, the the theory with the least assumption should be accepted. And it will also serve as a brief overview uh, and introductory discussion, uh, as it is very likely uh, Walt Thornhill uh, will be coming on LUA as a guest in the very near future. So uh, let's go ahead and, and kind of run through the Electric Universe and, and, and kind of show the listeners, uh, you know, how, how classical physics is done, because, uh, you know, most, most people alive haven't really seen that uh, <laughs> from modern physics, which, again, that's very, very sad. But, uh, you know, things are looking up. We're going to end on a positive note here. So... Uh, I remember when we were talking about this, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you, you, you uh, understand the electric universe uh, theory of the sun pretty well. And I guess uh, the, the, the main idea is that the, the sun, every, everything in the universe and in, in the universe is, you know, connected by, uh, you know, electricity, which means that the sun is electric, electri electrically connected to the galaxy. And uh, whenever you see things like solar flares and coronal mass ejections, that is the electric sun that charged object seeking equilibrium with its environment. So that's kind of the, the, the as far as I've gotten into the electric universe uh, theory of the sun, uh, but uh, what do you have on it? Well, I think what's important is to understand how both of us may have been taught that the sun works. So when I was in school, uh, like all the way up through high school, because that at that point I, I diverted away from these types of sciences in terms of like sitting in front of a class, what I got, was receiving was that the sun is a thermonuclear event that somehow is held together by gravity. So it was like a constant explosion, but the gravity is so huge that it's keeping the explosion in check. And within the sun are all these convection layers that are producing the various elements inside there. That it's like a solid thickness mass of these types of explosions 
that, um, you know, literally fu fission and fusion both going on and certain amounts of helium, uh, I'm sorry, certain amounts of hydrogen in, in the center are being fused together in fusion to produce the energy and then thus to produce layer of growing helium. And once all the hydrogen is exhausted, then it's all just going to be helium fusing. And at that point, the gravity will be unable to sustain the entire sun and it will begin expanding. And this is a very, um, I want to say, you know, you, you flatter me with my, like, I'm really good at, at the sun and solar physics. I'm not. This is not my specialty. This is my hobby. Okay. So <laughs> just wanted to say that this, this was where I got, like, this is, uh, it's fascinating. Like, give us this one miracle. The miracle being, show us ex an explosion, a thermonuclear explosion that includes both fission and fusion, which is uh, seemingly has been done on the surface of the earth and in the atmosphere and underground and massively observed by instrumentation many times over apparently and the miracle is that gravity could contain such an explosion but instead of it being one tiny little explosion as on earth you know because comparatively speaking size of explosion fission and fusion wise those atomic explosions are tiny and that sun is huge and that it does help to understand what's the history of the thermonuclear theory of the sun and it's actually, of course, as old as thermonuclear science is. You know, right. before that, the sun was looked at as a thermal event. In fact, there was a time in the past where it was considered uh, considered like a big burning ball of coal in, in the space, basically. And that was like it was a, a radiating heat like that, like the way a glowing coal ember radiates heat. That's how it was considered because there was no thermonuclear and atomic physics going on in, in the ways that, you know, have created seemingly real thermonuclear explosions on Earth. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so that theory is very big in vogue and is taught as true. It's taught as unquestionably true that the sun is the thermonuclear event and that gravity is the part that holds that explosion from enveloping everything in, in the nearby solar system. That's that's Earth and the inner planets, by the way. Yeah, and, I'm, and let me mention this real quick. I, I should have done this at the start of the at the when we when we kind of first began. Um, so yeah. so with with modern science, um, there there has to be so, so you have matter, and there has to be some sort of component, some sort of uh, some something that actually holds the universe together, which is why. Uh, you know, as is the case uh, with uh, modern physics today, unfortunately, if uh, you don't know how to explain something, you just make it up. So now we have, you know, dark matter, antimatter, which is what supposedly connects the universe together, um, or I guess allegedly, according to mainstream science, as far as I understand it. Uh, and the, the the EU approach is that no, it's 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 electricity, <laughs> and there's uh, there's a lot of evidence to show that. Uh, there's an entire right. YouTube channel, Thunderbolt Project, uh, that does a terrific job uh, covering, you know, just, uh, you know, they have space news where it's kind of the mainstream, like the, the developments based off of, uh, you know, kind of uh, current events. And then there's, uh, you know, obviously uh, all of the, the work that's been done in the past, doc free documentaries, uh, books, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I just want to say that I bought this theory hook, line, and sinker of a thermonuclear sun and gravity holding it together. And I didn't come upon the EU theory, the electric universe theory, and I'll, I'll just use the other term, plasma cosmology. Since plasma as a component of electric ma electromagnetism w was something that was used to describe the events being seen both in laboratory and on the small scale, in weather on Earth, larger scale, in the nearby solar system and with the sun, bigger scale, galactically, and then intergalactically between galaxies and between superclusters of galaxies. So these theories were scaled upwards. But here's the deal. Regarding the sun as being an electrical event, an electrical uh, phenomenon going on, the, the reason why these multidisciplinarians, these physicists and electrical engineers and you know uh, astronomers, they pooled together their observations and saw that there are some anomalies. The surface temperature of the sun is measurably cooler than the atmosphere. That doesn't happen with a thermonuclear event, period, as observed, you know, as, as being measured. So that's, that's anomalous. Um, the, the movement of the entire surface of the sun as observed seems anomalous. It doesn't seem like it would be like um, it, that gravity itself would, would work that way. But electromagnetically, it would work that way. And, and, gra if, and gravity, if, uh, they um, 
something often mentioned by proponents of the electric universe is that you know gravity is a very very weak uh, weak force and there's this this massive I, I don't I, I don't know it's it's it how, how, I don't know how much stronger the electromagnetism is but the the force of gravity is uh, is is very very weak compared to uh, the the uh, electromagnetism or just electricity so um, so so yeah that's something too that they, that they talk about quite often right and it just goes from there where the these uh, mathematical description of appearances were based upon that one miracle the miracle being gravity is what holds our planet together our solar system together the galaxies together and holds the galaxies in formation with each other and that's the miracle and so since the math doesn't actually make that work what they came up with was a concept called dark matter meaning all this matter that has presently is too dark to actually see with the tools that we have available apparently so they make up that since it has to be gravity, since that was the presumption, the, the miracle or a priori conclusion, then therefore there must be all this dark matter out there, which just adds to the gravitational, the, the gravitational mass needed to keep everything spinning the way it happens to be observed. And that's, of course, a perfect mathematical description of appearances. So now I just basically said, so, well, when, what would the... Plasma cosmologists say, the, those who promote the electric universe. And they're saying, well, essentially, they see what you just described, Shane, so eloquently, that, that there is a whole bunch of charged objects in this universe. And as the, the charge seeks equilibrium between each other, this connection of electromagnetic forces create what we observe, the connections, so that a planet all the way far out there, such as Pluto, instantly seems to move and know when other things are going on in the inner areas of the solar system, which, if it was just gravity alone, would be impossible. And now, of course, we've had probes that are sent all the way out there into the Plutonian orbit and, and you know, in that whole region, looking for, is there any dark matter in our solar system that keeps it together moving and spinning in this predictable way? And there's no dark matter in our solar system that's been observed. There's, you know, no nope. large untold masses that have been found. And yet it spins, and yet it seems to, to relate. Um, the astrophysics is often referred to as the queen science, meaning like that this is presumed gravitationally to be so and true, and it's presumed to work in the ways that are given both in high school level and college level and even graduate level work, the presumptions are continued and made that it has to be gravity, even in the face of, I would say, evidence, such as like probes that are looking around for dark matter, you know, in any possible way that would have to affect the solar system just to start with. And in absence of this um, actual evidence, they still, there's a whole lot of people who cling to the theory. Yeah. Um, the, the, no, here's the deal. Um, no, like, as you wrote, Physicists still don't understand gravity, but I'm going to add one to that. They're, physicists still don't understand electromagnetism <laughs> or the well, strong I, I or weak force. I think, I think, the, you know? I think the, you know, the, I guess the converse way of saying, like, saying that is the physicists don't know a whole lot. <laughs> they claim to, right. but they, they don't know a whole lot. And that was, um, and, and I want to mention, because we, we've, we've, we've been talking about gravity a little bit. Uh, Walt Thornhill did a, a very good presentation on the long, his, the long understanding of gravity. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and what what you were getting into was, was was kind of that, and it's uh, it was it's another one of those things where you go through government schools and everything is just uh, like everything kind of seems in order. Like okay, we're we're like uh, we're okay, so this is the explanation. All right, so that's how that's how it works. Well, uh, yeah, physicists don't understand gravity, uh, so. Uh, it, and this is just a really, really fantastic way. Uh, and I love, I love how sarcastically um, Walt Thornhill kind of, <laughs> kind of pokes fun at these, uh, these mainstream uh, beliefs. But um, he says that to, to understand gravity, uh, you know, we must understand why matter has mass. And uh, he made a joke. Well, yeah, in nature. That last month, they were still uh, asking the question of, uh, uh, does reality exist or something? So we're a little far away from that. Um, and, and plus, uh, you consider what they're doing. Uh, you know, looking for the, uh, the Higgs boson. Uh, the God particle that gives matter mass. They're still looking for that. So, you know, gravity requires that understanding of mass, and they don't have that. Uh, so, I guess continuing forward, Newton had no explanation for his uh, law of gravity, uh, yet he made the mathematician's mistake of raising it to a universal law. I'm kind of paraphrasing uh, uh, Walt Thornhill here, uh, which allows the fictional story to continue, giving rise to black holes, dark matter, uh, etc. 
So yeah. he kind of provides a, an interesting explanation here, and, and obviously it's very you know shorthand, not uh, not uh, the long description. But uh, he defines mass. Uh, the mass of a particle is a measure of how much energy is absorbed internally in its deformation rather than its uh, acceleration. So they answer the question. So what causes gravity? The sum of all the aligned subatomic dipoles that produce uh, that produces the profoundly weak force of gravity. Um, so uh, it sounds a whole like, a whole lot like electromagnetism, which it's supposed to, right? Uh, so, right. Yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say it just um, since I don't know because I don't have the Daryl Institute to look all this stuff, you know, and like scientists get on this. I don't have them over here, <laughs> so all I can do is speculate, you know, because I've been reading and looking into the subject for uh, pushing eight years now, and. The best I can do, Shane, is just to say it seems, though of course it's a speculation, that gravity is a form of the electromagnetic spectrum, a very weak format of it, as there are stronger formats that affect things. And you can see that in, in evidence like this. You can drop a nail on the ground, and it takes this great big earth, gravitationally speaking, to pull the nail down, but a tiny little magnet to lift that nail up. So that magnet is demonstrating an aspect called electromagnetism. And this Earth is demonstrating the other type, the very weak form called gravity. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right, right. And so, yeah, the, the E proponents uh, explain gravity in electrical terms as, as, as you kind of, uh, as, as you, kind of you know, I guess, put, put out that kind of theory. They, they also believe, and, and this is what uh, was... Uh, was different. There was one. I, there's there's a lot of scientists I've been you know introduced to in the past few months. So sorry if I for, if I don't remember all of them offhand. But uh, um, and this this isn't a new thing. But uh, the uh, gravity is uh, uh, so they believe that gravity is repulsive in addition to uh, being attractive. And if you watch that presentation by Walt Thornhill, um, there's I mean that you you kind of have to see these images. Uh, like it's it's it, at least maybe you don't. For me, I, I I need to see these images to see exactly what they're talking about, um, and it's a really really fascinating stuff. I think it really helps to start over with an open mind, go in like, okay, how about this? You're not an astrophysicist, you're not on payroll. Hope I mean most of you listening out there, you you don't get a grant or get refused a grant if you get to look into these things. You're a free agent. You can actually start over from the beginning. Imagine, especially if you're skeptical of government school and many things that were brought up there, if you understand history and how the big lie certainly can be propagated and you know, spread loud, loud enough and wide enough is taken for truth. If you understand those concepts of perception management, as, as we've described many times, then you can say, okay, start from scratch. Maybe you completely got it wrong as did a whole bunch of other people, and, and I don't mean in a malevolent way, mostly they're just parroting things as what was given to them. So you can start over with thunderbolts.info or holoscience.com, that's H-O-L-O -O science.com, and those are ways of looking at these subjects that we're covering just to start over to say, what if you didn't get it right? What if there were other ways of looking at it? It's kind of like the minority report. You know, the majority report seems to be tainted, I would say, in, in these sciences. And in every field of endeavor that I've ever studied, if there was a lot of money into it, <laughs> these sciences have been bastardized to the tune of profit of billions, I would say trillions of dollars at this point. It's a very profitable industry. Right. That's my claim. Right, right. So, so I mean, there, there. Uh, so, there, there are obviously other aspects of the electric universe, but I want, I want to just. So, we, we mentioned the, the, the Big Bang, um, you know, as, as, a, as a supposed theory of, of how the universe came into existence, and uh, also the, I guess, the what Newton did by uh, universalizing the law of gravity, and how it, you know, led to things like, uh, um, you know, uh, black holes and such. And there was a really good video. Um, there, there's a movie that came out called Interstellar, uh, and I watched it. It was a fascinating movie. Uh, they had to enter. Uh, they had to enter a black hole to find a new planet to uh, to inhabit because, uh, you know, the there's the this, the Earth started uh, you know not pr producing precipitation, so like they were having trouble surviving. So they sent a few sci a few uh, scientists and astronauts out there to you go go try to inhabit this planet. And Thunderbolt's project did a uh, um, a video called Interstellar Science Fiction or Pure Fantasy, 
Uh, and this is, so this is just the fourth, like I chose the fourth thing because it was just the most mind blowing thing uh, for me, but he just let the, the guy who kind of, uh, you know, debunks it or attempts to, uh, or point out the contradictions might be a better way to put it. He just lays out point after point after point after point about how this is, uh, this is something's wrong with this. Something is wrong with this. So, uh, in regards to black holes and gravity, <laughs> as well as, uh, you know, the, the, uh, coming about of the, the, uh, as well as the big bang theory. So he says, uh, Stephen J. Crowther says, quote, the fourth thing of note is that all black hole universes are eternal, but no Big Bang universe is eternal. The astrophysical scientists tell us that the that all Big Bang universes are of finite age, around 13.8 billion years. Thus, they insert an eternal black hole universe inside a universe that is supposedly around 13.8 billion years old. That's not possible. End quote. And you remember with the with the uh, with the quantum mechanics. Uh, you know how they changed it, uh, changed it from contradiction to law of complementarity. I'm guessing that's probably what they did there. Uh, and and right. as, as uh, Kant uh, kind of said, you know, uh, uh, reason inevit inevit inevitably falls into contradiction. So this is this is wrong. Like there's again, law of non-contradiction. A is A or A is not A. It can't be both at, at the same time. There, there's so much to be seen. Like, I think that uh, people wish for that certainty. They wished for, like, everything's already been figured out. There's just a few details being worked on. And, and yet there's gradualism, which is the popular in vogue theory, that, for example, the solar system, the way it looks now, is the way it has been for basically the, since the dawn of time. And then there's actual evidence which demonstrates that it seems like there's, there's good evidence supporting that the planets and the position they're in now weren't always in this position. It There's even evidence that the planets themselves may have been in different positions during the actual lifespan of humans being alive on Earth. So yeah. um, this this is kind of important news, you know, that, that gradualism, which is, uh, I would say, like, it has the popularity du jour, kind of like gravity is popular in astrophysics du jour right now. And then there's a minority report saying, no, actually, there actually has been, like, there seems to be massive evidence to show catastrophe, which is what happens when you have planets changing position in the solar system. Catastrophe seems to be evident multiple times over, as demonstrated by a variety of astrophysical effects and planetary effects, you know, yeah. um, electrically speaking. So I just wanted to point out there that if if you have the open mind to actually look at these pieces of evidence that Electric Universe proponents put forward, you see that there could be much more interesting things going on and that the certainty can be put aside as to say, I'm not sure, maybe there's more, you know? Right, right. And there, there was one other fascinating thing in that, uh, in Walt's discussion on gravity and uh, has to do with, with the dinosaurs, which I, I mean, just every, and this is one thing I, I've really enjoyed uh, about uh, my, my journey to get where I am today. Uh, whether it's you know science or my my views on government or whatever it is, uh, it's there's there's so much to learn and and, and a lot of uh, time a lot of time I've spent has been on unlearning the nonsense I've been taught, but uh, one of the one of the really interesting interesting I guess uh, theories is that uh, so so the the I guess the, the the mainstream theory is that there's a giant meteorite that somehow encompassed the entire Earth and killed all the dinosaurs. Uh, well, the the electric universe theory is that. Uh, um, you know the so so Newton laid out that universal law of gravity, um, but if uh, and this is something that uh, Sheldrake laid out in his present his TED presentation, which uh, you know got removed from their, from their website and caused a whole a whole debacle. Uh, yeah, by the way, for the folks that get uh, you know pushed out by mainstream science, those are probably the guys you want to look at. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, no, he he kind of mentioned that uh, you know the the measurement of gravity changes. Uh, it, it changes all the time. So how can this be a universal law? Can we try to figure out you know what's go what's going on here and kind of you know. Um, you know, look into this a little more. Well, the, the electric universe theory is that, uh, you know, obviously gravity hasn't always been the same. It, it hasn't because um, if the gravity on Earth, if the gravity on Earth when the dinosaurs were here was the same as it is today, they couldn't like they you imagine how much they weigh hundreds upon hundreds of tons. May it probably more than that, it, more than that, too. Um, they their, their their bodies, their legs, their necks wouldn't be able to support um, support them. And, and those giant flying animals, they sure as hell wouldn't be able to fly. So. I mean, like it's 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 really fascinating stuff, guys. It really is. There's so much more to unpack in this discovery of just putting aside the certainty and looking at actual evidence, putting aside a trust in authorities, and looking, I would say, at what's being brought forward. 
And unfortunately, there's a lot of dismissal because that's the training to dismiss what's new is such a training. I mean, uh, we, I think, Shane, we experience it all the time with people who have a pushback for the orthodox or extremely popular point of view, whether it's political or scientific or, you know, even just simply tribal and social. There are, it's expedient to speak the language that everyone else accepts. And it often is friction causing to put forward ideas that are uh, contrary, contrary to what's popular. So, yeah, I think we're pretty much getting close to the end goals of this bastardization of science that we've been uncovering. Right, right. I, I guess w one, one other thing real quick is when we were preparing for this, you mentioned, and it was a really, really, really good point. That's uh, um, what what passes as skepticism today is actually agreement with mainstream theory. So do you want to speak to that for a moment? Yeah. Uh, if you go to Skeptical About Skeptics, which is a website, you can see that the definition of skepticism, which once meant questioning and, and you know, like seriously looking f for a more accurate view by virtue of questioning, well, that has changed now to supporting what I would say would be a widely accepted and extremely popular perspectives. And I'm speaking of widely you know, supported perspectives, including, for example, man-made global warming, including the thermonuclear sun, including gravity as a, a powerful force within astrophysics and cosmology. And... And that's just like a touch, you know, like, and of course, go into healthcare, such as where I, you know, got introduced to all of these ideas and investigations um, that, you know, you can trust your doctor, that they know what they're doing, that they're test they, all those drugs and surgeries were well tested, so you can trust them. Those are claims. And the, the end point of all of that is, is that the skeptic societies, as you'll see with Skeptic Ractor, uh, Skeptic Raptor as a website and Skeptical Wiki, those are websites out there, th read into them and they will say very, very negative and dismissal and certainly logical fallacy filled things, including ad hominem attack, regarding these minority opinions that me and Shane have been talking about for these hours. And then you'll see on the flip side that they're very supportive of the mainstream conclusions. So just like with the, the word liberal once meant of or befitting the free, do you want a liberal amount of gravy on your mashed potatoes or a conservative amount of gravy on your mashed potatoes? You know? right. um, but now liberal does include people who promote taxation and massive regulation and further government help and a universal basic income and things of that nature and Bernie Sanders. Um, the, the definitions have changed in a great way. So skepticism is one of those things where now people you know, subscribe to Skeptics Magazine and it completely supports the standard theories and it attempts, uh, frequently attempts uh, debunking of, I would say, dissident views. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's as, it's as we kind of, uh, you know, mentioned earlier about how you got to have multiple definitions of these things like classical physics versus, you know, physics because, yeah, you know, language changes and, uh, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, in, the, in the negative way. Uh, most of the time in a negative way, actually. So, so yeah, let's go ahead and, and, and get into kind of uh, get into kind of the end goals here. I mean, why? Uh, so, so these physicists are smart. You know, they they they're, they're smart. So they, they, so there has to be at least some of them who know. At, you know, at the very top, you know, we're going to get conspiratorial here. That uh, you know, they're feeding these lies to the masses, uh, or or did, or I guess uh, so. So I guess what what are the end goals here? Why why is why is physics in the state that it is today? Well. Since I wasn't at the board meeting for the ruling class, I can only speculate. So on, here are my speculations. I thought you went. I thought you went. Uh, it's just oh, I wasn't invited. No, I mean I, I missed it. I, I had a note from my mom. So here's the deal. Um, basically, I speculate that the I look at what it does. Um, the bastardizing science in the way that we've been describing creates a divide and conquer. It creates a divide and conquer between those who profit from parroting conclusions that lead to, uh, I would say, you know, people chasing their tail in a compartmentalization of knowledge. And 
I would say, like, uh, really holding firm to erroneous conclusions for literally generations. And it divides those people from those who are actually able to question and able to look at evidence, like, just like Groucho Marx, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? You know, <laughs> you know basically, it's... Um, it, it creates a separation and it goes into every single possible topic that you can name. You can have the scientific and open-minded approach and you can have, I would say, a, a very popular and orthodoxy type approach and it divides those two people. Those who believe in their doctor and those who question their doctor. Those who believe in a thermonuclear sun and those who question that and are actually uh, like very interested in investigating the electric universe theory of the sun. That's just an example. So that's one. The other part is, is this is a profitable industry. It's been made so. Just like um, the idea of supposed healthcare and medicine to deliver long living healthcare, at a certain point, there's also the profitability of hurting people at profit. You can only hurt them just so much before they catch on. So you just, it's been a slow and steady increase in hurting people at a profit for a long period of time in the medical industry and then promoting all the studies that just divide people into those who trust their doctor and those who do not. It's extremely profitable in every single scientific discipline to have these isolated scientists on the tip of their mountaintop, which is their specific discipline since they're not multidisciplinarians. And as they're all the way up there, they see contradictions of what they actually are studying compared to what is being promoted, say, in high school and on television and in university. They'll actually, you know, the higher up on the mountain you go, you, they see the contradiction, but they can't speak about it because it's not politically expedient and you might lose your grant. Yep. So what, what it is is it compartmentalizes a whole bunch of so-called smart people, which I, I would say are, in reality, they, their damaged critical thinking to me, demonstrates not so smart. They're very good at being diligent and following orders mm -hmm. and filling out workbooks when they were little and making papers when they're older. Right. But they're not so good at creating original thought and actually questioning the conclusions that are fed to them. Yeah. And there's all these various huge industries, a plethora of false studies. They have no practical applications. They're all out there. And I would say... Um, uh, the grand lie that was mentioned in the Third Reich has been well promulgated. You know, uh, this is Plato's cave written large, basically. Yeah, and I want to I want to mention one I guess one thing in regards to a profitable industry, and I think you uh, I think any, uh, an examination needs to be taken into the entertainment industry as well, like uh, Discovery Channel and History Channel. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, I, I and and I'll I'll tell you I'll I'll be honest with you, Daryl. I mean, th this was uh, probably a, a few months back when I really really got back into, uh, you know, researching this. And what I decided to do was I I'd, I'd watch you know a few episodes of like the universe or how the universe works. Have uh, you know Morgan Freeman speak to me, uh, and <laughs> uh, then I would you know uh, go and watch a documentary from the Thunderbolts Project. And I'll tell you what. Uh, the the universe theory, like oh the, this black hole, we don't know what happens at the event horizon. We have no idea. Here's what we can speculate though. Uh, it, that's far more like that's fascinating and just mind blowing, right? Like uh, I wonder what goes on in there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it, it real like it, it really is, you know, an unimaginable, unexplainable universe. Uh, makes for very good entertainment, but it doesn't make for uh for you know a pursuit of uh, truth. If that's if that's what you, what you're looking for. Um, so. Uh, I, I think that's an aspect too. I, I don't, and, and and plus another another point the electric universe pro 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 proponents make is that, uh, I mean you know the especially like the um, kind of the mainstream astrophysics is all just computer animations. That's all it is. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and yeah. Just you know putting putting algorithms in, into a computer to explain things. It just uh, it's um, yeah it's not uh, not what's actually going on there for the most part. So. Uh, I think the the entertainment aspect too. I mean, that's probably a pretty that's the entertainment industry is obviously a massive industry as well. So uh, that probably has some something to do with that too. And I want to say that most of the active and living scientists today were exposed to the predictive programming that of in their formative younger years consumed these movies and television shows and media that you know use these vehicles, these MacGuffins, these these ways of you know these claims and and they make a great and amazing compelling story you know i mean yeah, everything tale, yeah. like i'm 
Yeah, and uh, like I mean, the black hole was a Disney movie, wasn't it? You know, I think, and all of these things were promoted out there, and uh, you know, they they show this universe working along these lines and principles. And in the formative years, those messages come through, in my opinion. So now the modern day actual scientist whose livelihood is dependent upon getting that grant. Well, now you've got multiple things. You're going to go against what you were taught as a little kid, the things that you deeply believed in. That you, you know, you knew that they were fictional stories, but they were based upon some truth. That, so you were told. It it would be, I would say, troubling in a humongous way for many of them to realize that they were fully lied to and and specifically, precisely manipulated. And of course, I can't prove that claim. I suspect it based upon reading into this and and studying predictive programming. Yeah, and if you were a, a modern physicist, uh, you wouldn't, uh, you probably wouldn't have the humility to, sell, to say that I don't know. So I think that's a, a good point too. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm more than uh, I, even before I looked into the electric universe, I still had kind of that mindset. I've always been very, very, um, you know, into you know investigation. Uh, and uh, you know, a few, a couple, of few years back, I, you know, I, I, you know, became an atheist, and everyone was like, oh, so you believe in the Big Bang theory? It's like I. I haven't looked into it. I mean, I'm not going to cling on to creationism or the Big Bang theory. I mean, there's, there's, I'm not going to cling on to a false dichotomy. There has to be some, some other explanation. Uh, and in, until I see evidence for, for anything, I'm not going to just uh, arbitrary, arbitrarily, uh, you know, cling, cling on to what, uh, you know, most of the folks, you know, adhere to. So, I don't know. It's, it's uh, obviously, like, I guess the, the first half of this, this discussion are thereabouts, uh, you know, depressing. Uh, it is like the, one, the first time I heard that presentation by Harriman, it was, uh, you know, frustrating, you know, this, 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 this avenue invest, of investigation that I, you know, love, uh, science is, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the studies and, and the research and, uh, and some of the technologies that are being worked on, uh, you know, they're, they're based off of, off of, uh, you know, flawed science. Uh, so it's, uh, so, th so there's kind of the, uh, the, the, I guess the worst part of the story and the better part of the story is there are alternative theories out there. Um, that still rely upon classical physics, upon reality, um, that believe that the that the, the universe is knowable. That uh, we, using our reason and uh, observation and experimentation, uh, can know, uh, you know, reality, just like the electric universe. So, any closing thoughts, Daryl? Yeah, I just want to say for you listeners out there, please consider this whole thing. If you actually followed us all the way here to the end consider this as a good beginning point, not just to touch upon the bitterness of what David Harriman shows and demonstrates in his lecture, the, philosoph the philosophical corruption of reality, but to go into looking at what did multidisciplinarians do and what are they still doing regarding look at, looking at evidence and where they're going with it. It's a, a bright new future is here if you can actually just savor the fact that you just don't know start over just please start over from a um you you're not sure you don't know and and a whole new world is opening up so uh, there's a lot more hope if you can get rid of this compulsion to be certain of conclusions and if instead you can just adapt now to new things and finding out what is right rather than being right okay Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, is there any? Is there? Uh, uh, definitely appreciate you coming on, Daryl. It's always a fantastic conversation and subjects that we don't normally cover on the podcast. So, I'm sure some. I'm sure most of the listeners uh, appreciate that. And uh, make sure to check out the first two productions uh, in the Scientific Consensus series. I think I'll just toss that in and toss this. Uh, well, this is going to be at least a couple of few episodes for TFR and probably a couple for for uh, Liberty Under Attack, the podcast feed too. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much, Daryl. And uh, is there anything you'd like to plug before uh, before we uh, hop off here? Yeah. Anyone who's interested in getting cryptocurrency and understanding how to do that, you can consider my consulting services, dbcrypto.com. That's short for DarylBeckerCrypto.com. And I'm certainly going to promote this production on voluntaryvisions.com, my portfolio of all of my audio and video work. All right. Very good. Well, thanks so much, Daryl. It's, it's always it's always fun to talk to you. Um, because we we have a lot of similar interests that uh, you know I, I don't really find in, in, in a lot of other folks. So uh, um, obviously you know returning guests so far multiple times. So we'll we'll certainly have you back on the on the podcast. Right on, Shane. This is a great production. Uh, wishing you a great day over there. <laughs>